because we're with Christ in the desert. It's supposed to be Lent right now. Mm. And and we're we started with the meditation on fasting and and what that means. That we we're thinking about not just the the fasting and the desert and what that is, but how how men or women are are going to be affected differently by the 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 Lenten practices. It's interesting. Christ had to fast. Christ fasted for 40 days before he established his his mission to his people. He went into combat against the the adversary. He went into combat uninhibited by anybody else. So I'm reading I'm reading David Friedrich Strauss's The Life of Jesus Christ Critically Examined, which is the the 1840 George Eliot translation from the fourth edition of the German to understand exactly what 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 kind of crisis we're in in understanding Christ and mm. I was just reading this evening about the temptation <laughs> in the desert and I mean for for Strauss who's doing this it's um, saying it's like why does Christ need to go into the desert he knows who he is but the interesting thing the one of the things that Strauss said was that it had not struck me properly before was it's the only story in which the devil actually like appears this is strange he's trying to be all like you know this doesn't make any sense how could the devil actually appear and you know in previous in previous meditations i've thought about the specific temptations that satan brings but that what you're talking about he had to go into combat it's like it is the one place in the bible where satan actually manifests i mean it seems he appears to him and then tempts him with the food and the you know the the angels will catch you if you throw yourself off the temple and bow down to me and I'll give you the world. It is a, it is a combat. And in, in, in proper mythological terms, Jesus need to, to, needed to do this to do the training. I mean, we do recognize this, that he goes he, go, he goes through the temptations we do so that we know how to deal with it. Yes. He had to go through the training to be able then to go through what was coming, which was, mm. I mean, everything from his teaching and his compassion for people to the crucifixion and and his you know, but portrayal and abandonment. So the preparation for his death in various stages. We do all of this training to know how to respond in the situations that we're, we find ourselves in. Obviously Christ is going to have some pretty difficult situations to be in, but you think about all of the bouts that he has with the Pharisees and the mm -hmm. Sadducees, you know, the people who loved him and the people who hated him, all of the challenges that we have socially constantly there as a test for him. Why are we here on the internet? Why do we put ourselves through all of this? Why do we go into the desert and sit there with Christ being hungry, right? Why does Christ go into the desert? St. Anthony goes into the desert outside, you know, it's like he's living in the Nile, right? The Nile is one great long city. It's a strip city. It's the original Vegas strip. <laughs> You can only cultivate, right, like the banks of the river. And it's like, there's nothing but desert on either side. And so you think, yeah. it's like, why are the earliest monks living out there in caves in the desert? Like St. Anthony. He, he's actually not, I, there, there are other monks that are doing it too. When, when, but he's, he's drawn into the desert. Why go out into the desert? It's the wilderness. It's where the demons are. It's where the demons are. He's going there for the combat, for this training, for this practice. You know, it's like this, it makes no sense. These, these desert fathers, the earliest monastics, why do they end up leaving the towns along the banks of the Nile and going out and live in the desert? And Brown explains, and this is, this is a, a complicated thing to get your head around, but it fits with what we've been trying to say about sand and glass and stuff like, so you go out into the desert because that's where the demons are. What are demons? Or aliens? No, Scully. I'm based now. I'm oh. hunting demons. How do you be a based monk? You go into the <laughs> desert and you hunt <laughs> demons. But what are the demons? What actually are they? Fallen angels. Satan fallen under Christ who's sitting on his rainbow. Creatures that are no longer obeying their creator. So what, what Rob, uh, Peter Brown explained, the desert fathers thought they were thoughts. Right? Mm. The demons are both both inside and outside, which fits with the messengers and fits with the way we engage with them on the internet. They're logismoi thoughts. And what's, what's, what's complicated about them is you go out into the desert because that's where they are. They're actually like entities that somehow live in the desert, but you carry them with them. 
because they're your own they're your own sins. Mm-hmm. One of the the famous uh, desert fathers of Agrius Ponticus gives a list of the eight deadly thoughts, which then Gregory the Great will pick up because he spends a lot of time in Constantinople and they know all all these monks know each other, um, and and so you know we'll recognize them as sin. In, uh, sorry. Seven deadly sins like um, pride, envy, sloth, lust, greed. Um, I always forget several of them. Anger. Um, I'm I'm certain you've been tempted to one has been tempted to some of these while being on the internet. <laughs> but I mean, the, the internet sins are all going to be the the very intellectual sins, right? Pride and envy, anger. It's 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 harder to be have the physical sins with sloth. Well, maybe sloth, lug, uh, lust. Well, porn, <laughs> um, gluttony. Yes. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm just thinking about the process of why they're, these things are magnified. Because when you're in the wilderness, it's a kind of sensory deprivation. The internal things get louder because they're, you don't have the, you, you don't have the architectural bombardment and you don't have the civilizational sensations. So it's a kind of sensory deprivation. I mean, the internet and- is kind of sensory deprived. In that sense, it is. We're still working towards the definition of demons, and why it might not be completely inappropriate for us all to be on the internet, but with awareness of what kind of space it is, and and you know, what kind of wilderness or city it is. Uh, but that mm. because of its disembodied nature, it has its own repertoire of temptations, because we're so desperately trying to create this embodied thing that can't happen for us in this city. Mm. This sand sand world. Yeah, I'm thinking of the first major argument I ever had online was with someone I knew. Mm. It reminded me okay. now. Oh, good. And I was talking about <laughs> it was just a it was a it wasn't even directed to anybody. You know, it was like shower thoughts, but kilt shower thoughts is <laughs> like African nationalists for the you know first people to defeat a, a fascist power. So calling nationalists fascists makes no sense, right? So it was me being autistic and just speaking out loud and saying, "I don't understand why everyone's calling nationalists fascists. This doesn't make any sense. They're not the nationalists defeated the fascists. Why are you saying this?" Someone picked it up someone that I knew very well, but responded in a very, very different way that was shocking to me. Like even now, if I think about it, my heart starts beating really quickly because it was not the same person. It's a completely different entity responding to the post. How interesting. How I know you, I went to your wedding. (laughs) I mean, your wedding photos, because I was, I was in the bridal party. They forgot that it was me. Suddenly it was someone defending an enemy in this case nationalists are the enemy Mm. being stripped of my real identity and then suddenly i'm in digital combat mode so we're in the wilderness and i'm having a battle with someone who has forgotten that i exist outside of this space completely and got very very nasty very quickly and it sort of triggered a pylon and yeah it was it was my first experience of what happens when people are fighting in that space and the rules of real life don't apply. And so they don't apply in the digital environment. Mm. People's behavior changes in the digital environment. Because the way that the person had responded to my uh, statement was completely different to the way that they would have spoken to me if we were in the kitchen having a coffee together. So I was shocked. It was quite traumatizing. And uh, then I thought, okay, do I leave? And I realized I didn't want to mm. because I was not wrong for so many reasons. I just was not wrong. Nationalists are anti-fascists, so or a certain nationalists were the anti-fascists, and it was to me, you know, it was triggering my autistic sense of like justice, <laughs> yeah, justice, <this> horrible, yeah, exactly, <laughs> this horrible injustice, and I'm not going to let them beat me down. So I kept saying more and more and more, and then realized what was going on was this uh, this same dynamic that you're describing. You know, women are using these spaces to build social worlds, and suddenly I'd interrupted the social world by proposing an alternative fact that was going to ruin the consensus of this particular tribe and it was not tolerated so i had to be squished Mm. the strange thing about it was that it's spilled out into my real life as well you know it's like the 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 swiss army knife of your relationship tools they don't uh, it doesn't apply online so i was faced with the shame demon which is a really big one for Mm -hmm. women being you know, screamed at, told that, and you know, and being screamed at, told that I was stupid, uh, a pseudo intellectual moron, 
but all, all in text, all of this kind of, right? Just, all of it yeah. in text. Only te- it was just pure text. And then the effect of reading it, it was like, wow, who or what is attacking me right now? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like this person has disappeared and now it's something else. It's not two people arguing anymore. There is something else coming through in that moment. The Desert Fathers, the, the Logismoi, these demons are out in the desert and they have real existence, but they also work on your thoughts. And you seem to bring them mm. with you and you... They, they go there to practice against them. My um, based con host, Robert Crozy, is his, his new book is coming out. His Cross Time Crusade is coming out. And I was reading it because I gave him some advice on the Templars. <laughs> um, and, and it's very interesting because it has demons in it. And he's, he's theorizing about the demons that are manifest that- because of the technology that we are involved with. In the ancient world, in this, they have this idea that cities have geni- geniuses, right? That they have deities, yes. beings, egregores, right? Everybody t- knows about those now. Emerge from the interactions of the people in the city somehow, right? It's like somehow a city has a demon. Christelle de Colonge, who our friend Ken was reading, was talking about how that's the way that the city defines itself by its recognition of this entity being demon, whatever it is. One, those are real too. In, in Christian thinking, those are false gods, but they are real gods, right? They're just not the right one to work. <laughs> so, and, and those are the beings that in, in you know, like proper idolatry are taken into the idols. We, we talked about idols a few weeks ago, right? And they're, that they somehow inhabit the uh-huh. idols, but they can inhabit cities. And what I think Bob Crozy is, Robert Crozy is doing in his, in his book is thinking about, well, they can also inhabit the internet, right? It's like, it, it It kind of also fits with Charles Strauss's theorizing about information, magic, and mathematics. Mm-hmm. That it, it's like, once you get all of these information processors that we have, all the motherboards connected through all the internet and such like, these beings are emerging from it. They're not, I mean, it's whether they're conscious, whether we're, we can't really control them because they're all of our collective activities, but they are definitely somehow feeding on us. Yes. Mm. Well, one, pretty terrifying. Um, and two, that means like every time we come into the internet, we're potentially engaging with them. Now, you could see, if you were listening properly, we do it every time we walk here in a city, too. I, I think this, this, the, if there's fear of cities, it's to a, large, you know, to a certain extent a fear of this kind of collective reality. Mm. And whether you're in Chicago, where that collective reality has one kind of character, or whether you're in, I mean, cities have characters because of this. New York is different from LA is to, and it's partly geography, but there's also a, a real sense of collective reality. We're doing mm. that on the internet too, of creating these, I just keep saying, I mean, it's like, it's an entity that's a reality that comes into being because of all of our interactions and that you were having mm. that experience with your friend. It's like these, these channels of trained discipline thoughts or chaotic terrified thoughts rachel's theory of current politics because all of these the entities <laughs> so get, keep getting activated by our collective activity melisine i wonder if it was our doing wondering if it was ourselves yes it is it is ourselves we are i mean all of the it's like but yes and no right we we somehow in in the bible the angels and demons are real that you know the devil tempts christ in the desert that's somehow real um and the desert fathers go into the desert to train themselves against these entities somehow. Um, we in the mm-hmm. internet are in this situation of experiencing them. So, okay, well, we can't escape. They're everywhere. That, that They're part of our reality, right? That they exist with us. But if we don't train against them, they'll trap us in sin. There, said it.